Well, hi, I'm Pastor Mark Williams. Today, I want to share with you the final message in the series from the book of Ephesians, Living Life to the Praise of His Glory. This has been such a wonderful opportunity for us to be reminded of all of the spiritual blessings that God has given to us in the heavenly realms. But also, today we learn that in the heavenly realms, though we are seated with Christ and the beneficiaries of all of these blessings, there are still battles. Uh, a defeated enemy sometimes continues to try to resurrect and try to oppose and try to resist. And so possibly we should not be surprised that the Apostle Paul ends this letter by giving instructions for life's battles. Join me as I share with you today, stand firm. You know, in spite of all of the advancements that we have seen in technology, in spite of all of the advancements of modern science, in spite of all of the advances in medicine, in spite of all that we have learned from sociology about the culture in which we live, in spite of all that we have learned from psychology in the study of human behavior, the fact still remains that we live in a world of danger. When we look around the world globally, conflicts are at a 30-year high. There are so many wars and conflicts that are taking place in the world until more than 30 million children from these environments have now been displaced. And according to UNICEF, among the 30 million people that have been displaced or children that have been displaced because of conflict, many of them are becoming targets for human trafficking, targets for exploitation, and targets for abuse. Everywhere you look, you see conflict. From Afghanistan to Mali, from the southern Sudan to Yemen, to the war in Ukraine, to the uprisings that are now taking place in Russia, to the civil wars in places like Syria, to the instability that is taking place in Asia as China begins to set its sights on Taiwan to the various instability that is being caused by North Korea as they continue to test ballistic long-range missiles, to the violence that is taking place in Central America and the violence that is being taking place in Mexico. But not just out there, our own nation that we live in has become a place of such conflict when we see all of the division, all of the gun violence, all of the abuse that is taking place, when we see how divided our nation is and the extents to which people will go with their own given ideologies, you can see that it is a world that is filled with danger. But going a step beyond that, I personally believe that this also is a world where we are seeing an increase a feverish activity, if you will, of the demonic. Now I realize when I make a statement about the devil or the demonic, many people will probably think that I'm coming from a myth, a pre-scientific, a pre-enlightenment myth that people once used to describe an embodiment of evil. But honestly, I still believe in a personal, real devil and real demons. If you take the scripture seriously, the scripture teaches over and over again about the reality of demons. 
Now, I also believe C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, you know, you can make two equally dangerous mistakes. One is denying the reality of the devil. And the other one is being obsessed with the reality of the devil. Well, I'm not obsessed with the reality of the devil, but I do believe that there is a real devil and there are real demons. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, we read of Satan, who is referred to as Lucifer, the star of the morning. Fifty-six times in the Bible, we read of the name Satan, the arch enemy of God and man. In fact, we read in Revelation chapter 12, he is referred to in verse 2 as that old dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan. We read Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25, or, he, or verse 10 rather, he refers to one of the demonic spirits as being Beelzebub, the Lord of flies. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 38, he refers to the devil as the evil one. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, we read where the apostle Paul calls him the lawless one. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3, Jesus refers to him as the tempter, or Matthew does, in describing the temptation of Jesus that he is the tempter. We read also in Ephesians 2 and 2 that he's the prince of the power of the air. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 4, he's called the God of this world. In fact, Jesus himself in John chapter 8 called him a murderer called him a liar, and called him the father of lies. The apostle Peter, when he was writing to Christians that were living throughout the Roman Empire, he encouraged them to be sober, to be alert, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There is a real devil and there are real demons. He does not always come against us uh, with a pitchfork and with a tail. He doesn't always come in the form of demonic possession, although that is a real thing. He doesn't always come in the form of disasters or in the form of disease. More often than not, he attacks us by putting lies in our minds, deceptive ideas that are targeted at disordered desires that try to get us to behave in ways that dishonor God or to draw us away from God as being the chief object of our worship. In First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1, it was Satan that provoked David to number Israel. In Zechariah chapter 3, it was Satan that withstood Joshua, the son of Jozadak, the high priest, and accused him before the angel of the Lord. In the book of Job, it is Satan who accuses and torments Job. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 15, we read how the devil or Satan is the one who tries to steal the word of God that is sown like seed into our hearts. Luke 8 and 29, we read that it was Satan and demonic forces that occupied a man in Gadara legion and drove him to live among the tombs. Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, although not all disease comes from the devil in terms of him putting disease on you, we do read in Luke chapter 13 of a woman that was bound with the spirit of infirmity for 18 years. In Luke chapter 22, we read that it is the devil who put the idea in the mind of Judas to betray Jesus. We read in that same chapter, Jesus warned Peter that Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. 
It was the devil that gave the idea to Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the Holy Spirit. It was Satan in Acts chapter 13 that tried to inspire Elamus Bar-Jesus to prevent the testimony that Paul was given to the island deputy Sergius Paulus to pervert the white way of the Lord. We read in the travels of the Apostle Paul how Paul said that it is Satan that is trying to prevent me from going to the city of Thessalonica. He further said that Satan was the source of this thorn in the flesh that he suffered. A messenger of Satan, he said, that has been coming to me and tormenting me. In the book of Jude, we read how it is Satan that disputed with the archangel Michael about the body of Moses. The whole point that I'm making is that if you take the scripture seriously, there is a real devil and there are real demons. He comes as a thief in order to kill and to steal and destroy. He would like to do nothing more than to put deceptive ideas in your mind that target desires that are disordered and to try to cause you to behave in ways that will draw you away from God as the center of your life and as the object of your worship. He would like to bind you. He would like to blind you. He would like to grind you as he did with Samson. But I have come to also give you some good news today. Yes, the devil is a decided fact. Yes, the devil is a destructive force, but the devil is also a defeated foe. For 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came, and for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus took your sins and my sins and all of the accusations that have been made against us. He took them to his cross and and he nailed them to his cross. And the Bible said that he despoiled or he made a spectacle of principalities and powers. He, he triumphed over them, disarming rule and, and power and authority. And he said, behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and power over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. All authority Jesus said has been given to me in heaven and in earth and in the longer ending of Mark he said go and preach the gospel and these signs will follow those that believe in my name they shall cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover lift up your head O gate Lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, and this King of of glory has said to you and me I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it well praise the Lord can we just give praise and magnify the Lord for victory today Hallelujah. well just like the army of a country that has been defeated still at times tries to revive and come back until the Lord comes again and the devil is cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, we will find ourselves from time to time encountering spiritual battles. And this is why the Apostle Paul describes for us in some of his closing words in this letter some very important instructions for how to live and fight and stand firm in what the Lord has done for us. He talks about strength that we need. He talks about enemies that we will confront. He talks about armor that we're going to need to wear. 
Then he talks about the prayer that we need to pray. First of all, notice the strength that we need. Beginning with verse 10, finally, <laughs> the Apostle Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now, this is a present passive verb, this phrase, be strong in the Lord. It is present indicating that the strength that we need is something we will continue to need. As if every day you're going to need this. But then it is also in the passive voice indicating that the strength that we need every day is not a strength that comes from us. It's a strength that comes from outside of us. It is the strength that comes from the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. One translation, participate in the strength of the Lord. This is the reason Jesus said in that memorable phrase in John chapter 15 and verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. And those that abide in me will bear much fruit, but without me, you can do nothing. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, not that we are anything of ourselves or to commend ourselves, but our sufficiency, our competence is from God. God. Again, he wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians 3, 3, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. We glory in Jesus Christ and we do not put our confidence in the flesh. The surest way to defeat is to try to fight a spiritual battle in your own strength with your own fleshly weapons with your IQ, with your education, as important as that is, with the achievements that you've made in your life, as important as that is, you and I will utterly fail every time. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, wrote the Apostle Paul. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not fleshly. They're not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the tearing down of the strongholds of Satan. And so many times in these battles that we fight, the chief strategy of the enemy besides filling our minds with lies and deceptive thoughts, he tries to wear us down. If you've ever been in a trial that just goes on and on and on, if you've ever fought a health crisis that just seems to go on and on and on, if you've ever encountered a conflict that just continues to go on and on, you get what I'm saying, that you just get to the point that you are worn down physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and you feel weak, and you feel anemic, and you feel that you can barely make it. And it is when we get to those points of fatigue, physically or spiritually, that we become especially vulnerable to these lies that the enemy will try to fill our mind with. It's no coincidence that in the book of Daniel, it speaks of the coming Antichrist whose chief strategy is to wear out the saints. But praise be to God, he gives power to the faint. To those that have no might, he will increase strength. The youth shall faint and be weary. The young men and women shall utterly fall. But those who wait, those who hope in the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not get tired. The promise of God in Isaiah 41 and 10 is fear not. I am with you. Be not afraid. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I 
will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There is a strength that is available to you today. Do not forget that back in chapter 1, available to you and I is the strength of the Lord and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power that the Apostle Paul wrote about in chapter 3, whereby he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in you. Your strength, your resources may have failed, but at this moment now, turn yourself over to the Lord and receive the strength of God in the name of Jesus. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The strength that we need. The strength that we need, we need it because of the enemy that we confront. Here, beginning with verse 12, there is a description of the enemy that we confront. The enemy that we confront, first of all, we learn that this enemy is supernatural in his personality. This enemy is extraterrestrial in his places that he occupies. This enemy is organized in his hierarchy. Notice what he says in verse 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's go back to the beginning of verse 12. Notice the word struggle our struggle. This lets me know that our enemy, first of all, is close in his proximity. This word struggle here is a word that is better translated perhaps wrestle. The picture is a hand-to-hand combat. That we're not fighting an enemy way off into the distance. No, this enemy brings the battle right up to your face. It is close in his proximity. Our struggle is against a force that is close in his proximity, supernatural in his personality. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood now. There may be people that are saying things that are hurting you. There may be individuals that are coming against you. Or there may be structures that are coming against you. But listen, the enemy honestly is not flesh and blood. The enemy is supernatural in his personality. In fact, the enemy that that we are fighting against are rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Invisible to the natural eye, inaudible to the natural ear, there is a conflict taking place all around us and some of it is coming right against us. Notice that we are wrestling against rulers. The word rulers there is the word arches. It means chief demons, chief rulers. This is followed by the word authorities, exousia, delegated power. The idea is that these authorities are working at the behest of the rulers that they are serving against the powers of this dark world world. In other words, some of these powers that are invisible are using real people, real structures in our world where they have become rulers of darkness, the rulers of this present age that are rulers of darkness that are walking at the behest of these demonic forces. And then against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, you don't have to believe what I'm about to say to go to heaven. This is my personal opinion. 
I also believe that some of these demonic forces that we are fighting are, are terrestrial. They're, they're, they're super terrestrial. I'm, I'm trying to say that they occupy territories. I believe in territorial spirits. I, I believe that there are demonic forces that have actually set up strongholds, not only in people's minds, but fortresses in specific territories and areas of this physical world. Just like we read in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, it talked about a demonic force that was called the Prince of Persia that was hindering the prayers of Daniel that he was praying. That over him in this area where he was living, there was a demonic force that was fighting against the prayers that he was praying up to heaven. I believe there are cities. I believe there are towns. I believe there are also domains in our world that the enemy has gained access to and controls and has set up a fortress there to prevent or to try to prevent the entrance of light and the entrance of the gospel. He has claimed ownership of that territory. When Jesus talked about the gates of hell will not prevail, he was talking about not gates that were moving. He was talking about some of these strongholds that the gospel was trying to penetrate against. And he says those gates of those territories that have been occupied by the the enemy they will not be able to stand against the advancement of the gospel and the advancement of the church for again I say Jesus has said I will build it and the gates of Hades will not be able to stand against it praise the Lord the enemy we confront because of the strength that we need and the enemy we confront the Apostle Paul says there's going to come a time that the evil day comes that the methods, the stratagems of the devil are going to be targeting you. And in order to stand, you need to put on some armor. So he talks about the armor that we need to wear twice in these verses. Put on the full armor of God. Now this is the language, it, 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 grammatically, it is the aorist imperative, that, which, which carries with it a, a degree of urgency. Like, 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 hurry, put it on now. Don't wait. Put it on this very moment. Put on the full armor of God. It is as if the Apostle Paul may have been looking at one of the Roman soldiers that he was chained to and seeing the armor. And so he began to use this to apply to those of us who are in spiritual battles. He says, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you're able to make a stand, to stand your ground. Having done everything to stand, stand firm. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness in place. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Shield of faith. Sword of the spirit. Helmet of salvation. Which is the word of God. Praying always. Look at these. He says, first of all, get the belt in place. You know, in, the, in those days, many of them wore long flowing robes. And when it came time to work or to fight, they would have to gather those robes up into a sash. And they would have to tie them so that it wouldn't prevent your progress when you were running. In the case of a Roman soldier, it was the belt that held all the armor in place. And the Apostle Paul is saying what holds you together in the time of conflict is truth. The enemy is trying to fill your head with deceptive ideas that are targeted at disordered desires. But the way you're going to overcome is hold together with truth. The truth of God. Not only truth, the belt of truth, but he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And on a Roman soldier, there was this breastplate of metal that helped to protect everything that was vital in terms of organs and especially his heart. And what protects your heart is the breastplate of righteousness or the righteousness that comes to you when you accept Christ as your Savior. That righteousness 
not only gives you a right standing before God, but that righteousness protects your heart. He goes on to say, as you stand your ground, that you need to be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers in the day wore these sandals, had a thong here across the top, and there on the bottom or on the soles, there were, there were these nails. There were these spike-like structures that helped a soldier to be able to gain footing in the area where they were. And what keeps you and I grounded, what keeps you and I standing firm is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel that I have given to you, the gospel that you have believed, the gospel in which you stand. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that keeps your feet grounded when you are trying to make your stand. Then he goes on to talk about the shield of faith. He says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. Soldiers in that day were outfitted with a shield about four and a half foot long, two and a half foot wide. The enemies of Rome would often try to attack by taking these arrows that were dipped in pitch and set on fire and they would take an arrow and they would, they would shoot it with a bow in hopes to be able to get that flaming fiery arrow over into enemy lines and destroy and set things on fire. But these soldiers were outfitted with a shield that was dipped in oxide and every time one of those fiery darts hit that shield, all of a sudden that oxide was able to snuff out the that fire and the Apostle Paul says you have something that can ward off can extinguish all of the fiery darts of the devil it is the faith the faith by which you believe the faith in which you believe the same faith that kept Abel in the blood and the same faith that kept Noah in the ark and the same faith that kept Moses by a burning fiery bush and the same faith that kept Elijah by a brook called Cherith and the same faith that kept children of Israel uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in a fiery flamey furnace the same faith that kept Daniel in a lion's den the same faith that took Elijah up and Enoch up the same faith that kept Jonah in the belly of a whale is the same faith that is able to defend you against all the fiery darts of the enemy the belief in God I believe in God that it shall be even as he has told me it's that kind of faith that enables you to stand when you are in the midst of a battle the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God you look at how Jesus overcame the devil in the wilderness he took the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and he gouged back the enemy. When the enemy was coming against him, questioning his identity and trying to get him to bypass the cross, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And the devil fled from him for a season. This is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Then he goes on to say, pray. <laughs> so many times when we're talking about the armor, don't we stop in verse 17 a lot of the times? But verse 18, right after that says, and pray. Pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer requests. Be alert, keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Then the Apostle Paul wrote, oh yeah, and pray for me that I may have the boldness to fearlessly proclaim the Lord's word for which I am an ambassador in chains. When he says to pray in the Spirit, I don't think he's just saying pray as you are led by the Spirit and certainly do that. 
I don't think he's just saying pray as you are inspired by the Spirit. I think he means to pray in the Spirit. I think he means to pray in the Spirit as he described in 1 Corinthians. When I will pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding also. I think he's saying allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you in these languages, in these tongues, to pray in tongues, to pray in the Spirit as the Spirit leads you, as He gives you the utterance. Because the truth is, in the midst of a groaning creation, we don't always know how to pray as we are. And we reach the end of our vocabulary. But in that moment, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome, the Holy Spirit comes and He makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And he makes intercession to the saints according to the will of God. And we know that in all things God works together for good. I happen to think, as I'm preparing for today, of an occasion when I was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, I was a uh, young single evangelist. And that's been a long time ago. I was over at East Coast Bible College at that time and had been asked to preach in a convocation. And I was down on my knees and I was praying. And I tell you, I was having such a struggle praying. It felt like I was praying against the brick walls. It felt like I was getting nowhere. I felt literally bound in my prayer. And I had reached the end of my vocabulary and I was just about ready to get up. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the one that is called alongside to help like a barrister at the bar. I felt the Holy Spirit come into that room and he sidled up beside me. You know what that word means? That Texas word moved right, just moved right up next to me. And all of a sudden, he began to pray through me. And this prayer that was so weak and this prayer that was so hindered suddenly was energized with power. And I began to pray in the Spirit. Literally, it began to penetrate that, that, that force that was keeping me from getting through. It's as if I could see that prayer going up through principalities and powers and rulers and authorities and touching the throne of God. God reading that request and sending back the answer all the way back down through the principalities and rulers and authorities and touch me there in my room to the surprise of the devil. That's one thing about the devil. He can mimic tongues. He can mock tongues. He can impos uh, be an imposter of tongues, but he cannot interpret tongues when you are praying in the spirit. You are praying on a hotline straight to heaven. Hallelujah. The devil can't even understand. He's surprised when the answer comes oh that God would fill us again with the Holy Spirit so that we could pray in the Spirit and realize that God in all things works together for good all oh, that passage in Romans 8 blesses me because it begins with we don't know then it says but the Spirit does know and then after we don't know when the Spirit does know the next thing it says we know that all things in all things, God works together for good. Today, as we gather in the Lord's name, you may be facing a real trial and a real battle that has drained your strength. I'm reminded of a story in the book of Exodus. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a story that I read over and over again about how God brought deliverance to his people that were living in bondage. And as they were making their way out of Egyptian bondage, they were on their way to the promised land. All of a sudden, the enemy from which they had been delivered started chasing them. Their past started chasing them again. A Red Sea in front of them, they couldn't advance. The past behind them, they couldn't go back. But it was in that moment that the Lord spoke. 
and said to Moses in Exodus 14 and 13, do not be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord who is with you. For the enemy that you see this day, you will see no more forever. For the Lord will fight your battle for you. And all that just came alive in my heart as I prepared for today. So perhaps you're in this room today and you're in a battle. You're in a spiritual challenge. Maybe your strength is being drained from you because this is just going on and on. Maybe the Lord wants to speak to you today. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord who is with you. The enemy that you see this day you will see no more forever, for the Lord will fight your battle for you. You know, I just want to reiterate as we come to the conclusion of this message today, that the battle is not yours, the battle is God. Stand still, see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. The enemy that you see this day, you will see no more forever, for the Lord will fight your battle for you. Victory belongs to the Lord, and victory belongs to you. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to sharing with you more from God's Word very soon.